at the outset, I uh, thank the organizers and uh, Professor Mina Danda and Annapurna Vagre. And uh, going back to the comments made by uh, Anu that uh, Cisco has not taken any action and uh, it's also declared that uh, caste discrimination is not prohibited in the United States. I think that's vague and then I don't understand with, which, with, with what impunity uh, they're saying that because I would argue that Title Seven of uh, the Civil Rights Act bars caste discrimination in the United States. I think, and, uh, and if one reads the plaint, it has eight causes of uh, action. And, uh, and, I, and I think that they're well drafted. Uh, uh, and then we also have a duty uh, uh, on us. First, it's, we must write to the US lawmakers uh, attaching uh, the legal, uh, the equality labs. I think they prepared a report on caste discrimination in the United States. I think we have to email all the US lawmakers about uh, the, pre uh, the prevailing uh, caste discrimination among the, the Hindu community uh, in the United States. And we could also write to the uh, president, you know, for urgent measure uh, to, uh, to issue an ordinance to uh, prohibit uh, caste discrimination uh, in the United States. And I also uh, uh, request the uh, organizers of uh, the president's uh, uh, present lecture to have uh, the legal experts uh, in the United States on uh, uh, Civil Rights Act to deliberate on it. I think we can have a session on that. Yeah. Thank uh, you, thank you. Um Professors Danda or Wagri, would you like to comment on this question? Uh, yeah, I, I think it would be incredibly useful to have a, uh, a discussion group um, with with civil rights lawyers, human rights lawyers from the United States uh, to uh, look at um, Title VII and also the, the state legislation because the Cisco case is being um, is being brought, um, the action is being brought um, on the basis of two separate pieces of legislation, state and federal. Um, so a, a, a thought, a discussion about how those pieces of legislation can be used. I don't think it's it's immediately obvious um, that caste discrimination is prohibited by Title VII. That that is um, legal work that ha that has to be done, as it as it's been done in in the in the UK. Um, but a discussion, uh, a sharing of knowledge, a sharing of expertise, uh, really really important. Thank you, Susanna. Did would you like to add? Um... Uh, yes, so thank you. I think that the suggestion that there should be a discussion with the lawyers and us, and especially the legal experts like Anapurna is a great one. Uh, and I think that's that's really important because uh, it, as Anapurna was saying, you know, the legal the legal scope of of what is possible in that jurisdiction. And to learn from the obstacles we faced here in our jurisdiction, it can be done in a direct way, lawyer to lawyer, I think. Uh, um, whereas, of course, uh, listening to longer discussions like this one or reading other reports, it doesn't give you all the exact flavor of things. So, for example, neither of us touched on the whole political question because we didn't mm -hmm. have the time. We can go have another meeting perhaps. The whole political question of how those who are opposing the legislation by and large are open supporters of the Conservative Party and mm -hmm. the change of the for fortunes of in the, in the elections that happened, that the change of government that happened also played its role. Something mm -hmm. that came under uh, coalition government and then with the Conservative mm -hmm. government and then later on now with the the whole change that has happened post Brexit, all yeah. of that has made an impact on what is possible, who the government is listening to. Likewise, I think in the United States, I'm just speculating, but the rise of certain Indian figures in the mainstream American political scene is going to make a difference to who is going to be heard, which part is going to be heard. So it's very important right from the word go for all activists to form or acute and, and very thoughtful alliances. I can say that activists in UK have been quite ecumenical. They have approached any MP who's willing to listen to them. So there were, for example, three MPs of the Conservative Party who had supported the legislation against the whole of the other Conservative Party. But that, for example, one of the persons who supported later on, he is cooled off. 
So we in in the long battle, you really don't know who is going to run with you because MPs too think in terms of their local constituency and if their local constituency is going to alter and they are going to be able to stay in power without the support of Dalit voters or without the support of pro-legislation voters, they won't care, they will abandon them. So I think a great deal of political savviness is needed mm. in who, how you work through this. It's not just a matter of people and law. It is mm. taking mm. place in a, a much larger political environment. And so, uh, 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 but, but a direct conversation between lawyers is, mm. I think, very important. Can I just add, add to, to that? Um, uh, I think there was uh, a lot of um, kind of surprise and frustration that uh, certain politicians who had been on side with getting cast um, as a protected characteristic in the legislation, when they, when they were then uh, part of the Conservative coalition government, completely sort of disappeared. And that was very, that was very disappointing. And it was, um, it was a lesson that politicians will always look after their own political interests um, first, almost, 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 almost always. Um, and also, I think the lesson, certainly in the UK, and I don't know about the US because I, I don't know how legislative change comes about at the federal level in the, in the US, except that it's, uh, it's not easy. Um, but in the UK, um, the cast experience is not unusual. You know, as I mentioned, it took years and years and years of campaigning to get sexual orientation uh, as a protected characteristic, which failed. And the only reason it came in was because of an EU requirement. So um, the, the, the sort of long, you know, the, the, it's the long haul, I think, is, is, the, is what I'm saying. I have a question from uh, Ravi Kumar. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's been really useful to learn about the process again. Here in the UK, we have brought together a whole range of Dalit groups. We formed the Anti-Caste Discrimination Alliance. We've brought together the Volmikis, the Rovadasia, the Buddhists and the Dalit Christians. And it'd be great to see that happening in America because you need to start forming more coalitions. And uh, I mean, many of you would have seen Oprah Winfrey this week endorsing the new book that's come out and how powerful that's been and the importance of having coalitions with other community groups. Currently, you've got the Black Lives Matter protests taken across the world and the impact that's had. And, uh, you know, many black music, music artists are global ambassadors. So being in America, you know, if I was there, I would be approaching you know, very influential musicians, you know, and briefing them and telling them about the caste system, you know, and creating these alliances because you will get opposition as well. As, as your campaign grows in the United States, you'll get a lot stronger organized opposition, just like what we've had here in the UK. So I'd say certainly take, um, take the opportunity of what's going on and form these broad alliances and come together on that Dalit front. And it needs to be Dalit led at the end of the day. Dalits need to be at the front of it. And people need to see your face, hear your voices. That's very important actually, you know, so people can see what you look like, hear you, because then, you know, they'll be more prone to act on that. So, you know, it's great that the Embedka Circle have brought, has brought this talk together. I'll certainly be joining in for more in the future. And thanks, Joanna Porna and uh, Mina for summarizing everything that's been happening. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, uh, Ravi Kumar. Hey, from um, the audience. Yeah, I know I have a question Go to ahead, both uh, Mina and uh, Ravana Porna. So when, when uh, we are dealing with this, right now we are dealing uh, with this more deeply. Now, now the case is manifested and the discrimination is, has been uh, manifested as a last shoot. At this juncture, most of, so there are two arguments. One is the caste is a South Asian, Hindu, uh, Sikh, Muslim, Christian and all problem. But actually the origin of caste is Hinduism. Can we confine to Indian Hindu system? rather than uh, taking it as a broad, can we confine, which is the origin of the caste system and approach from that way, which will give some solutions. And, and which is, what, what, what are the pros and cons of both approaches? Yeah. I, 
can i say uh, kartik what do you uh, just a question back to you what do you hope to gain by going into the question of origin why is it important not the question of origin the practice of caste is so prevalent among the hindus predominantly ha ah, so that's why a have, that's a different thing. Have... so for example you can cite i can tell you for example uh, in 2014 there was a really interesting article which uh, written by praful bidwai who's head now of friend and journalist who who uh, a short piece which he wrote uh, based on data of the uh, uh, of of um, I, nhss it's uh, it's an indian big uh, quantitative data of 40000 or something where you collect household survey data i forget the acronym of it it's also survey data i can send you the link of it in which it tells you gives you information about the percentage of a uh, brahmins and percentage of it who still own up to practicing untouchability okay so that it tells you 50% or 57% of this mm. group 20% of this group 39% of this group uh, that practices untouchability now you what you find in that really interestingly is that the difference is only in quantities and you can say rightly that brahmins as a group own up they themselves say actually their incidents might be more than what they own up they themselves say that they do practice a form of antiquity for example the question that is asked is would you let x person caste to come into your kitchen and the answer is no i will not that is a form of antiquity those are the ways in which those questions are asked so on the basis of information like that it is possible to give a broad description that people of x caste are uh, the more likely practitioners of what we know traditionally as casteism in this worst form which is untouchability right but what you also find in that data is that even among dalits there are people who will practice with respect to others so there is a real problem so the thing no, no, is that this thing. yeah sorry mina i'm not telling brahmin i'm telling hindu indian why you are going to who would you count who would you count that's the problem because where would you count it? i'm not well, telling brahmin yeah where would you count the list i mean there there is a huge question i'm asking you the pros and cons but need not go to the brahmin alone no 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 but i'm saying precisely talking in religious terms means talking in terms of these categories you know together collectively or separately okay you don't want to up, but when you start describing where do you have this information from what makes you say this right you don't have the background you don't have anything further to back up most of the impressions we have and there might be all right impressions most of the impressions we have are based on our understanding constructions very much informed by our theoretical understanding of origin and ideology but we also have incontrovertible evidence that casteism takes place amongst christians it takes place amongst muslim there you can't deny it how can you deny it so obvious that it takes place that in churches it takes place i i lot uh, bishop paris organized a conference in london in 2014 where i presented a paper which was about Christ, uh, they, where they were priests and it was for christian responsibility for dalits there were so many stories i was shocked to hear so many stories of such horrible casteism untouchability practice in churches in india it is undeniable so you can't restrict uh, your understanding of, you can't say that casteism mainly takes place and maybe uh, it, this is a this is sometimes a line i have found more would this take this question this line sometimes would this take this line but i'm not sure even if it is true of buddhists that they don't practice uh, casteism i in 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 terms of my own uh, you know interaction with people i think it would be very hard to say that people people at some point they do uh, forget that they in their new position which which is their accepted new identity they are not supposed to do so six is a great example six are not supposed to practice casteism but they do how can we there's so many examples of casteism among six this now i think pritam wanted to say something but this uh, the the um uh, uh, the reason there's recently been the uh, uh, kaltak has recently issued a statement 
which is saying that it uh, casteism we will not accept we should not because it they, it's come to light so openly that it is being practiced in ways which are totally against the principles of sikhism so i don't think even on grounds of simply facts that it is possible to restrict it and pragmatically i think it is just the wrong way to go that's my view i mean i mean i david is there somewhere and i don't know i think maybe wants yeah. to also say, add something can i can i just jump in really really quickly i i wasn't i wasn't quite sure i understood the question but if the question is uh that um state law uh secular law would should be used um uh, by reliance on religion, so you're you're making caste discrimination a religious issue. I I can't in the UK that would not be helpful. I don't know about the US, but uh, in the UK that that wouldn't be helpful. It would rule out it would rule out um, anyone then who wasn't a Hindu, and you have the separate question of how do you define, as Mina said, who counts, who doesn't uh, for bringing a, a claim if you attach it to religion. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a couple other questions from other participants, but I see that uh, Mr. Uh, David Mossi has raised his hand. So if your question, Mr. Mossi, is about, in relation to the discussion we just had, uh, and I know Professor Danda also referred to you, you could uh, maybe go first and share that comment. Um, yes, thank you. Although actually, I, it's really to say that I think this question of religion in relation to caste, in relation to law, in relation to um, strategies going forward in this situation is probably worth a separate discussion and it's not one that we have time to do here so um, I think there are many good reasons not to treat caste as simply a, um, a, a problem of Hindus but for the reasons that, um, that, that Meena and Annapurna have, have already mentioned also an approach that could very easily undermine um, a wider movement to address caste and also fail to understand the nature of the way that caste functions in a modern economy and the way that caste discrimination comes to be manifest, not through the practice of ritual or the practice of religion, uh, but in a much more in a much wider range of, of, of forms of, of uh, in-group protection, which is not specific to uh, particular religions. But I think really think this is a separate discussion. Maybe Kartik and others would think about perhaps having that as a as a forum topic. We don't have time to get into it. It's an important topic, but um, uh, yeah, we don't have time to do that now. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read a question that was dropped into chat. Uh, this is a question by Kartik Manoharan, and it's also been echoed by Ramya Vijaya. And the question is: Is castlessness possible? in a diasporic scenario when the root country is casteist? Or should the diasporic individual or community embrace a certain rootlessness so as to cut itself from caste? So the, um, can I go first? Because it's, it was addressed in the first instance to me, but Anup, I'll be very uh, happy to hear what Anupun also has to say. So I think here, the main thing is also to think imaginatively about roots. This is something I learned from my teacher. Quite uh, roots themselves are of many different kinds. So there are floating roots. Roots don't have to be embedded in a place. So to say that uh, we, we don't necessarily need rootlessness. All we need is lack of fixity in some essential or pre-given, uninterpreted, or uh, you know, uh, inherited understanding of something. What we what we need is uh, the ability to always be able to reinterpret what we do inherit. And in the more we learn about the past, the more we access the forgotten uh, seers and the forgotten saints and the forgotten people who who at in earlier times would have spoken against casteism. It's my very firm belief. I, maybe I'm just a, such a diehard humanist. I think it isn't possible for people to suffer so much and they're not to emerge amongst those who suffer a voice of protest. It's simply that that voice has not reached us. So there is no reason to cut off 
from whatever is your past. It is in fact necessary on the contrary to search for those voices. So I, I don't see why I should say, oh, I don't care to be an Indian or whatever. I, no, I certainly very much care to what happens. I'm not nationality wise, I'm British, but I care very much for what happens in that country. I do care for many people in that country who have been abandoned. So it does matter to me that I have to make links with, uh, you know, uh, aspects of the, those critical voices, which I want to hear. But again, I don't think also it is necessary to think of uh, a rootlessness. I mean, this, there is a whole discussion. I mean, there's a fashionable discussion also, but some of it makes sense, the nomadism and not being tied to this, that, or the other. But I think, uh, and to a certain extent, those who are uh, travelers and those who have left their homes and, and gone elsewhere are in a more adventurous are more adventurous spirits and they are always adventurous spirits who, who, who left. And, but they are adventurous spirits even in the past who left and traveled and went back. I mean, a great example is Guru Nanak who traveled globally so many different places and, you know, and went back. So there is no reason to, to be fearful of finding roots. What we must object to, of course, the way in which we are being sold a particular view of what those roots are and the way in which we are being told only those are the roots and you can't find any other, that is what we must object to. But if we don't engage in that battle, then we are already excluding ourselves. We are then condemned to remain a minority. You know, you can, be, and nobody minds. I mean, that's a, a very often how majorities do things. They will, if they can safeguard their majority, you can dismiss yourself and be that ascetic, that outsider, that fringe, whatever it is you want to call yourself and live your life the way you want to without any effect or any handle, any possibility of changing the vast majority, which is, you know, so it remains where it is. So I hope I've answered your question, Karthik and Ramya. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful note. And, uh, uh, you know, we would conclude both because we're really way over time, but there are two, three other questions that people have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask three people who raise their hand, Pritam Singh, Carly, and Barbara Natarajan to maybe share their questions uh, really uh, briefly. And then we'll take all of them at once. And after that, we will really have to conclude because we're already at uh, one o'clock, I think. Um, well, almost... We have three minutes left. So with that said, can I please ask Pritam Singh to please uh, share your question very, very briefly. And then Kali and then Bhad Bhuli uh, ah. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, we can. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, well, I agree with uh, Meena and uh, Anapurna about combining both the legal and the political mobilization. But there's one specific question which I want to ask uh, Anapurna, but maybe to others that Anapurna mentioned about uh, how sexual orientation and religion and age was brought into the realm in, in British law because of compliance with the European law. I was wondering whether there are UN uh, treaties which can be similarly used as a hook, whether in America or also in UK, to also uh, go on to the question of caste. So the way the European law was used, whether UN uh, treaties and laws can also be used. Uh, any, any, any ideas or any in, input on this from Anapurna or anyone who's been working in the US on that? Okay, uh, next question, please, from Carly. Yeah, <clears throat> can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, first of all, thank you for uh, arranging the session. My question is the content of what Karthi asked about uh, Hindu religion uh, specific. So, do we have any data of cases uh, Sorry, we couldn't hear you. The voice is breaking. You know, Hindu Sorry, we couldn't hear you. There is an underlying motive uh, of you know pushing the cast also to the. Kali, you're breaking up. Uh, could you please restate your question? Or type it. Yes. Can you please actually put it in chat? In the meanwhile, I'm going to ask uh, Bal Murli to uh, share your question, please. 
Uh, hi, hi everyone, and uh, thank you, thank you so much, Meena and Anapurna, and the organizers. Uh, um, mine is a very short one. I think, apart from all the wonderful things that have been uh, brought up, we also need to think of innovative ways to address caste. Uh, so, new domains, for example, that can be highlighted as problematic at this historic moment. For example, to go back to something that Anapurna slide mentioned in the UK law that they demand that uh, something needs to be in the public sphere in order for it to be addressed legally. Uh, the question then is, uh, has arranged marriage been argued in the UK to be in the public sphere and not in the private? Most of us think of marriage as private, but endogamous marriage performs a public function. It helps to reproduce caste monopolies. Uh, voluntary associations, for example, such as caste associations, uh, of which there are only a growing number in, in both the UK and in the US, uh, they actively shape marriage practices. They bring people together and they sometimes even help conduct it. And many of them set up trust funds. Uh, some of them register as nonprofits. It's 501c3 in the US. And there ought to be some way in which we can bring together, as, as the early uh, questioner had said, you know, we bring together legal experts, but uh, uh, scholarly experts, community um, leaders to think in innovative ways about this. Thank you. Okay, so we have, um, Kali, please go ahead and drop your question in the chat and we're gonna get started with the first two questions. We had a question by Pritam Singh about whether UN treaties would, can be used in the US and the UK. Uh, maybe I could go first on that. Um, so, so very briefly, the, the, the reference to um, EU law um, was uh, in that context, not so much that we used EU law, but rather we were obliged because of our membership of the EU to uh, comply with EU uh, requirements to introduce um, legislation on um, sexual orientation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, the point I was trying to make was that British governments probably wouldn't have, you know, if past, past history was to go by, British governments wouldn't have been willing to do that, but they had to because we were members of the EU and there were consequences for, um, for not complying with uh, EU law. Um, that, of the, that situation has gone now and it's a big loss. Um, in terms of um, UN treaties, um, uh, the UN, the UN treaties, particularly the Race Convention, have been uh, have been uh, the focus of uh, Dalit lobbying since um, since the early 1990s, and have provoked a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of op you know response um, from actors opposed to the idea that caste discrimination could be an international human rights law violation. So yes, UN law. Uh, you know, the, the sphere of activity in the UN around caste, not just in relation to the treaties, but in relation to uh, the special rapporteurs, for example, the special rapporteur, special expert on minorities, uh, 2016, very important report, um, uh, uh, analogizing uh, uh, Dalits with um, groups more commonly thought of as minorities and so on. The UN system has been massively um, uh, the focus. However, um, the big problem with international law generally, public international law, including international human rights law, is the uh, weakness of the enforcement mechanisms. So, you know, for example, the United States has ratified um, ICERD, um, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's done what it's supposed to do under the convention. It hasn't brought in um, easily uh, protection against um, caste discrimination. Um, so, the, you know, the beauty of a regional system like the EU is that once the state has got itself engaged in that system, it has voluntarily undertaken to abide by the rules. And technically, that's the same at the international level for the, for the uh, UN system. But the uh, consequences of not abiding by the rules are uh, very minimal compared to the consequences of not abiding by uh, EU rules. I don't know if that... Um, offers a sufficient example. It's, it, the, the, the use of the treaties is, is it's, you know, it's much more uh, uh, sort of for political and lobbying purposes. It's, it's, uh, the treaties obviously will be uh, cited, they were cited in the Turkey case, but um, there's also the question of 
whether a state um, uh, um, automatically incorporates international law into its domestic legal architecture or not. Um, so states like the UK, which don't, um, we are we are we are parties to the ICERD, but it doesn't mean that it's fully incorporated into our domestic legal system. So that's another another issue. Um, uh, the public sphere question um, that Belmuli mentioned. Um, what, what counts as a public sphere historically in the UK has been narrowing um, uh, over, over decades, over centuries. Um, marriage, that's one of the things that I sort of hinted at where, um, for example, um, online dating sites and so on, can, can these be addressed um, by treating them, for example, as, as, as services? Um, obviously, uh, we have legislation in relation to forced marriage, we have legislation in relation to consent to marriage, and um, we have legislation on marriage within prohibited degrees, which uh, prohibits uh, mar marrying um, intimate relatives. Um, but marriage is still very much seen as um, a, a, private, a private or intimate sphere matter. So the, the issue really would be, can it be can the question of, and I completely agree with Belmuli's um, analysis of the role that um, endogamy plays, absolutely. So the question is, can it be, um, can it be approached by, through, it, through another way, I think, at the moment, that's, uh, but it's something that um, I think quite a few of us are, are thinking about. Um, okay. okay. Uh, I, I just have quickly to add to the last one, but on, on UN treaties, I would simply say that Pritam, that uh, it's not just that something is uh, becomes a part of a treaty, but also that what uh, what leverage does anyone have to actually exercise a, a, a demand that something which is already included in a treaty is met. So we, we know it's not just in this question and many other questions. Many of these treaties are not actionable directly. What would you what would you do with it if it is there, even if it's there? And what are the means through which you would do it? So I'm just talking in a very general way, but Anapurna has answered your question, I think. On Murli, I want to say there's one particular new thing I've, I've been thinking about a, a bit in, in relation to marriage, is the place where marriage takes place. So that not just that you know ma marriage is a ceremony and that it has to take place in some premises now we know that in the cases of in the case of six there has been an issue so some some marriages have been stopped in 2012 a marriage was stopped because it wasn't allowed to take place inside a gurdwara or only some gurdwaras will allow others won't allow and the rules that govern religious places often come under exceptions now that might be a problem but if they didn't for example if they were charitable institutions which are supposed to be easily equally accessible to all members who subscribe then unless you throw out the person who you don't want to marry, that they can no longer part of this organization, you would have to give them that space, the place. So X person wants to marry outside caste, they have access to the right to that place, that they can bring, marry whoever they want to marry in that place. Now, those sort of issues, the, there are newly occurring things. And I suspect part of the reason also for the six, maybe I'm going ahead to whether that some of the six, who are afraid, who don't want caste to be entered in the Equality Act, would be afraid of that sort of application of the Equality Act in areas such as this one, of whether a Gurdwara is open to everybody or not for a marriage. Okay, and how, what would they use to stop that from happening? Because they do want to use their, their uh, uh, maintain their religious, uh, their caste boundary in certain ways, even though they say they don't, but that's what they want to do. Okay, at least those among them who are apologists yeah. for the system want to do. Yeah. So, so I'm thinking place might be, I mean, if mm. you think of practices that you want to be governed by equality considerations, then you have to also think of which places those practices take place. Mm. Yeah. Can I can I just add on to that that in the um, 2014 reports we talked about exceptions and if caste um, were to become considered uh, part of race, then um, uh, the prohibition on race discrimination, for example, access to premises and so on, would would apply. So uh, that that's that's already uh, there. But at the moment, it depends on um, within the architecture of uh, British discrimination, or it depends on uh, this, the the um, 
the argument that caste is uh, is an aspect of race, which um, is uh, a, a very a very highly so it's treated as a very highly suspect classification. So subject to uh, exceptions, are very very small. Thank you so much. Um, we do have now a question from Kali, uh, yeah. and it's a longer, more complicated question. Maybe uh, we could now uh, just now address one part of it, and then maybe we can get back to him via email. The rest of it. Um, the one question he asks is: Do we have data if which religion has more discrimination cases based on caste? No. <laughs> How would you have it? I don't think so. And also, I don't know where he means. So, for example, if you look at if somebody, I don't know if somebody's analyzed it, but so suppose somebody were to do a study which was looking at the cases which are brought under the in India under the uh, Protection Against Atrocity Act, okay, and then if you analyze and see who brings those cases against whom they are brought, you know, and the picture is I once looked at it on on the in the Punjab case. I mean, the picture is very complex because. Uh, uh, vast number of cases are brought but not uh, there's action only take place in some and then many are withdrawn because people first make the case and then they uh, decide out, outside before before actually being uh, taken to court and a vast majority are really never dealt with so whether or not legally there are cases is not determined there are complaints but until the time it's sorted, how can you say it's a case? Because those who, those who are, uh, there are people who will say this is a false complaint, that this actually doesn't happen, it hasn't been proven. So it's very difficult to get uh, really dependable data uh, on these sort of questions. So I'm talking about what is already recorded thing, you know, recorded in courts that people do this. So it's very difficult. And if you mean in the US, in our context, there are so few cases, legal cases, very few, a handful. And and they include also Muslims and they also include mm. Hindus and they also include Sikhs. I mean, if you look at the UK cases. So it's not possible to say which religion. Dr. Okay, do you have anything to add to this? Okay. Um, everyone, please join me in thanking Dr. Danda and Dr. Wagre. Uh, we really appreciate your work. Please accept the thanks for taking the time to join us today and share your experiences and your scholarship. Um, there were, of course, more questions. We could have gone on for half a time. Um, but I just want to remind everyone that this is very much an ongoing conversation. Uh, there is a, the next session in this series is on Thursday, the 13th of August. Uh, details are going to be on the AKSC website. So please, I hope you'll all join us and please join me in thanking uh, Professor Dhanda and Professor Wagre one last time. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for inviting yeah. all of you at AKSC. You're doing great work. This is yes. It's just, uh, you know, it's unprecedented. The, sort, the, the, the spirit with which you are conducting these discussions and the range of people that you are bringing in for the discussion. I just look forward, I wish I had more time. I just want to learn so yeah. much what's going on. Thank you so much for organizing yeah. this. Yeah, I'd, I echo, echo that. It's uh, absolutely fantastic and so efficiently done and so wonderful. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you both. Thanks everyone for being here and uh, we'll see you on the 13th. Thank you.